Am I on? I can't tell. There you are. Okay. Well, I've been gone for a couple of Sundays. Uh, it's good to be back. Good to see all of you. And it's great to see this rain. At least I like it. It's good. God is, God is good. He always provides what we need when we need it, it seems. We do have a few announcements. Um, Pastor Lonnie and his family are going to be going on a brief sabbatical for the month of July. And so Lonnie will be out of the office. Um, this isn't his request, but I, I guess it's mine. Uh, Lonnie's going to be in and out as far as being in town. I would ask that unless it's just really uh, a large emergency, so we say, don't, don't, don't bother them. You know, hol holler at me or one of the other elders, and we'll see if we can't uh, step in and take 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 you through any issues you might have while while Lonnie is recuperating or resting and um, other things. For, for the month of July, we're not going to have Sunday school, so it'll just be the worship service and uh, prayer in Sunday evenings. And we'll, we, of course, will have prayer tonight at at five. So y'all be sure and come if you can. Other things that we've got coming up: uh, the end of Jul the last week of July is Vacation Bible School Soccer Camp, and of course, we're partnering with the gathering for that. Uh, they are needing in need of more volunteers if you've got any interest in either soccer or working with kids both and of course the most important thing is if you know Jesus and you want to share that with young people they, they could use your help are there any other announcements that I'm not aware of okay if not would you join me in prayer gracious heavenly father we thank you that you've called us into your house, that you've called us into a relationship with you. Lord, we pray that your spirit would be present and active, that we would hear from you. Give us hearts that are open to hear your word. Speak to us, Lord. We need your wisdom. We need you to guide our lives. We thank you that you are a God who cares about us, about every detail of our lives. And Father, we come today to honor and worship you. We pray that our worship would be acceptable in your sight. We ask that you would bless this time, that you would be with Pastor Lonnie as he brings a sermon again. Give us ears to hear what you have to say to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Greetings in the name of Jesus. I see um, maybe we have some visitors this morning. Welcome. We want to welcome you and just um, pray that you would um, enter into worship with us. Let's stand as we begin. Say 
Spirit, adore Thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Seraphim falling down before thee, which word and art and evermore shall be holy. Did you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is, is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. It is, is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is, is anyone worthy? Is anyone holy? Is anyone able to break the seal, to open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Oh, he is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. Does our God between to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom, a priest to God, to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy?
we just give you praise and glory this morning. You are worthy of all our devotion, our praise, our obedience, our surrender, Lord. You are worth it all. You are worth it all, Lord. Sing it again. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of Is he worthy? He is. He is. Jesus shall reign where the sun does its successive journey run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till sun shall rise and set no more. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to lose his chains. The weary find eternal rest, and all the sons of want are blessed. To our King be I his praise, rising through eternal days. Just and faithful he shall reign. Jesus shall reign. People and realms of every tongue dwell in this room with sweetest songs, and infant voices shall proclaim their earthly blessings to his name. To our King praise rising through eternal days just and faithful he shall reign Jesus shall reign let every creature rise and bring blessing and honor to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud amen. To our King be highest praise, rising through eternal days. Just and faithful he shall reign. Jesus shall reign. To our King be highest praise, rising through eternal days. Just and faithful he shall reign. Jesus shall reign. You are Lord of creation and Lord 
of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are king of creation and king of my life, king of the land and the sea. You are king of the heavens before there was time. King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my Lord. its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my Father, we want to come before you, Lord, and we want to thank you, Lord God. You are the living hope. It's you are the resurrection and the life. You are the King of kings. And Lord God, we want to bow before you and recognize that we are here for one purpose, and that is to know you, to worship you, Lord God. How good it is, Father, to gather in the name of Jesus, to sing praises to you and to recognize that you are present with us Father I am asking Lord in this time this service that we have that you would make your presence known to each and every soul in this room you know where each of us are you know the struggles that each of us may be having you love us with an everlasting love you are here to show us mercy, to give us grace. You are here to speak truth into our life, to set captives free. And so, so do whatever work you need to do in each of us, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would come with hearts yielded, putting ourselves under your lordship. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you, God, for this rain. Thank you, Lord, that as the rain comes down and just brings a freshness to the soil, would your spirit move to bring a freshness to our souls, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go ahead and be seated. Awesome. Good to see you all. Awesome. Um, so, what we want to do this morning, um, wow, it's starting to happen. <laughs> yeah, 
okay, we'll use this. Um, so that's two weeks in a row. So um, what we want to do this morning, y'all know that we are going to be heading on sabbatical uh, for four weeks. So first we want to thank y'all for giving us that opportunity. And so just kind of an R&R &R rest relaxation, kind of getting renewed in the Lord. So thank y'all for giving that to us. Um, I, I, I've told Candy and I've told some of y'all, I know that the first week's going to be fun. I think the second week's going to be hard. And then I'm, I don't know about the third and fourth week yet. <laughs> so just keep us in prayer in that. Um, I really do think that, like Kenny and I have said, we really have not had this in like years. So this is going to be something very new for us. I know new for us as a congregation, but I'm really also excited about what God's going to be doing with this fellowship in the in the next four weeks. I really do believe God's just going to be moving in beautiful ways here. Um, and I'm praying that God's going to be moving in beautiful ways in our life as a family as we're going to be going. Uh, we'll be in Midland some, but probably be away for a, 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 you know, a while. Um, definitely wanting you all to know that if there's things that come up, please call the elders, you know, uh, you know, they're here uh, for you guys. Um, and we'll just see how it goes. Yeah, we're excited. But what I would like us to do, if we, if y'all could, I would like to call the elders up. Uh, I'd like to call my family up. And I would like us just to, if y'all would pray, pray for us, uh, kind of giving us that launch that we need. So elders, if y'all, you guys would come up. And family, if y'all would come up. <laughs> Abby's looking at me like, well, I mean. Lord God, we thank you so much for this wonderful family. God, we um, we just love them. We know you love them more. And uh, they need rest. They need this sabbatical, Lord, to be just to be found uh, fresh in you, Lord. I pray you would make this a time of refreshing for this family. As Pastor Lonnie said, it's it, it'll be something new for them. It'll be something new for us too. And so, Lord, I, I not only want to pr pray for this family, but I want to pray for our church family. Lord, I pray that you would help us <clears throat> to focus on you and not our pastor. That you would help us to step up and to uh, take responsibility. And uh, God, equip us as a church to focus our eyes and our hearts toward you and not toward man lord we thank you for what you're going to do and we pray that as the family uh, spends time together that they will spend time with you that they would just be refreshed and um, that your perfect will would be done in their lives lord we come to you as your children with empty hands we have nothing to offer but our thanks and praise for this family bless them we pray in Jesus name Father I too ask that you would be with Lonnie and Candy that you would watch over them during this time may your presence be so apparent to them. May they know you are with them. May they hear your voice as you refresh them, restore them, draw them closer together as a family and closer in their walk with you. We thank you for this time and ask that you would bless it. Bless them through this time with you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Our Father, um, as pastor of our church, pastor to all the people here, Lord Lonnie spends his time in ministry uh, um, helping and directing and protecting the sheep. And Lord, we just thank you for that ministry that, that he so 
uh, happily uh, conducts week after month after year. But Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you. Lord, we want to, in a way, um, just kind of reverse that care, and we want to send he and his family away during this time of, uh, of, of just care and, and, uh, and healing and, and restoration and revitalization for the work. And Lord, all the things that he gives to us so freely, we just ask you to bless them with. And Lord, we know that you are in this. We know that you are, are guiding them. We ask, Lord, that each moment of the next month, whether it's a, a big thing or a small thing, that they would see you in all of it, that they would, they would sense your presence and, and just make all those moments holy moments that are not by accident, that they're by design. And help us, remind us to pray for them as they're gone. Remind us to pray for their protection and, and for their revitalization and just the, the miracle that you desire to do. We just thank you for it. We just thank you and give this time to you because we know you are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, so it was also, I just want to say, um, Lee and Becky, it's good to see you guys. So good to have you all with us. So Jason co got a conversation with this couple at Michael's. We had some, but it was really neat, so it's good to see you guys. Um, and it's good to know that as we're heading out, um, that this church, I believe, is in just really good hands because Christ, this is his church. And so... Um, the church moves on. The church has a mission. The church has that call to go and reach and proclaim. And that's our prayer, you know, not just in July, but throughout. One of the things that was neat, just let me just share this. Like last night, the men got together at Shane and Maureen Spear. What an incredible time that was. So thank you guys again for hosting. And it was just really neat to get together with the other guys and just to really enjoy fellowship, uh, playing pool. Uh, there was a, a plan to go out and play some things out in the backyard, but of course the storm hit at that point. So, but it was just a really good time. Uh, so, and I want us to have more of those times together the, with the women doing things, the guys doing things, maybe us having some retreats, but maybe even in the month of July, we all to get together sometime on a, you know, weekend, just kind of hang out and have game night. So anyway, I'm not involved. I'm not going to be, you know. <laughs> I'm disengaging, so never mind. So, so. But um, one of the other things, and I'm not, I don't see Matt here, uh, but I just want to share this. Um, and it's kind of one of the ways that we just saw uh, God just kind of align things rightly because we were thinking about youth, we were thinking about couples group and all of these different things. And and Matt Pryor, we, we support Matt. Matt's been a missionary to UK, of co course, with COVID hitting. Um, you know, he had, he's come back and he's waiting to go back to UK. Uh, and he's going to go back. The plan is in September. But until then, um, the last couple of weeks, I've, we've asked Matt to take the youth group. And the youth is really responding well. We know the Birches have left, so it's... Basically, now the youth consists of all guys, um, <laughs> so it's really neat. Um, it's, there's about six, seven uh, that are coming to the youth group, but Matt's been taking it the last couple of weeks, and uh, he's going to be doing that with the youth throughout the, the summer and up and through September, Lord willing. And so just very thankful for Matt, the word that he brings the kind of connection that he had that he's already developing with the youth. So I, I want us to pray uh, for Matt also. Um, and so, Randy, would you pray for Matt? Father, we do lift up our brother Matt and his ministry. He, uh, Lord, he is waiting to be able to go to England. And so, Lord, we're just so thankful to have him here where he can help us. And, uh, Lord, we just ask you to minister to him uh, in your word and, 
and uh, just in your spirit, Lord, that you would uh, touch him deeply so that he can reach out to our young people and that he would have a fresh word each each time they get together, that it would be fresh and exciting and things that would inspire them to uh, go deeper and longer and and more with you, Lord. And we just thank you. Thank you for his help. We just pray that you'd bless him in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We want to just continue at this time of worship. I'm going to ask uh, Philip if you come up, or Randy, uh, come up and pray for the offering. But um, before that, and this is as we were praying, I just feel like I need to share this. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Uh, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Right? And the peace of God, which surpasses human comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so when we continue this worship, and even as we're praying for the offering, if there is something that you've been anxious about, and again, I don't know why this passage came to my mind as we were just talking, but if there's anyone in here that's been anxious about anything, I just want to encourage you to come up to the altar and let your requests be made known to God. Take that step out of faith. Give it to the Lord. It's not like we're, anyone has to, it's not like a magical thing here, but I'm just, it's that place of stepping out in faith saying, Lord, I just want to bring this before you. You know what I'm going through. You know the anxiety or the stress that I'm feeling. Here it is, Lord. And if you do want anyone to pray for you, we're happy to do that as well. But let's continue this time stand together and pray God is so good to us Father we once again just want to pause and, and just express our gratitude to you Lord you you are the God of all things as Lonnie just just uh, quoted that scripture Father you don't find anything too small in our lives that you don't want to be involved in the very number of our hair on our head are numbered. You know that. You know us intimately. We thank you, Father. Lord, you know our finances. You know our struggles. You know our commitment to you. And Lord, we just ask you to, uh, Lord, just continue to bless and to strengthen our faith. And Lord, we just want to give our tithes and offerings today, Lord, is an expression of that faith. We just thank you. Mm-hmm. Not that you're trying to, to beat us up or make us feel guilty about where we're at with you, Lord, but that you, you want to show us a higher way and a, a better way, a way that, that ins- can inspire us and lead us on the glorious road, Lord, your road. So, Father, we just thank you. Thank you. And we just commit these uh, tithes and offerings to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Jesus is our refiner. He takes those things that he wants to get rid of, and he burns them away. If we let him, thank you for that prayer, Randy, because it just reminds me that he wants to be involved in every part of our lives. He sees things that need to be refined that maybe we're not even aware of, but he wants to refine those to bring us into surrender and obedience to him. If the altar's where you meet us, Take me there, take me there, if what you need is just an offering. It's right here, my life is here, I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner, I want to be consumed, I want to be tried like fire purified you take whatever you desire lord here's my life i want to be tried like fire purified you take whatever you desire lord 
glory is my light. If your glory is to just come in, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place. Set it ablaze. I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried like fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried like fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Clean my hands, purify my heart. I want to burn for you, only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you, only for you. Clean my hands, purify my heart. I want to burn for you, only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you, only for you. Clean, clean my hands, purify my heart. I want to burn for you, only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you, only for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried like fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried like fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. You know this chorus? The words are not there. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O oh my soul. Rejoice, take joy, take joy, my King. In
Mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've loved you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Because your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after to me with my life laid down I surrender now you give everything cause your goodness is running after it's running after me cause your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after to me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything cause your goodness is running after it's running after me and all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you.
I just wanted to share just a sweet, powerful testimony um, that happened to me recently, talking about hearing the voice of God. Um, I was um, running an errand, and I was headed home from Sam's, and um, I was on the I was on getting on the access road, and I was I was the first one at the stop sign a stoplight, and um, a voice just in my head said, you know, somebody could run the the red light, and so I, okay, all right, I hear that, and uh, when it turned green and I was starting across right under the underpass. Um, I, s I went off slow. I went slowly because I, I just felt like God had said somebody could run that light. And sure enough, a pickup going about 80 miles an hour ran through the red light and never even stopped. And I was able to not slam on my brakes, but tap on my brakes and stop before he um, hit me sideways. And so just, I just wanted to share that testimony because God is so faithful and he's so good and he loves us so much. And um, he protected me that day and saved my life. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Now, children, y'all are dismissed. I know Annalisa's already in the back there, probably, so... It's kind of interesting. Um, well, interesting. It's not an interesting. It's a God thing, I believe. But um, the um, the title of the the message is learning to listen, <laughs> um, and and it has to do with learning how to listen in crisis. Learning how to listen when maybe. Some of the decisions that you have made have led you into the crisis. I mean, sometimes that happens. Sometimes there is God's mercy when we haven't listened, and yet he, he's trying to still get our attention in the midst of the crisis, saying, I'm still trying to teach you to listen to my voice and how I want to direct you. I'd like you to turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 7. And so Acts chapter 7 is, um, actually has to do with uh, the Apostle Paul has uh, already been in Jerusalem. Uh, he's been arrested uh, for proclaiming the gospel. Uh, what riled a lot of people up is that when he was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, definitely he's preaching Christ crucified, raised from the dead. He has been... Uh, already on a missionary journey, reaching Gentiles with the gospel. Uh, that infuriates. I mean, he's got a whole lot of people angry with him, and they want to kill him, and yet he's arrested. And in that arrest, there's God's mercy of, of protecting him because it's not his time yet. And, it, and it's God's call on his life saying, you will go before Caesar. And, of course, Paul, uh, he says, I appeal to Caesar. And so there's been the arrest. There's been being held uh, in prison. And now in Acts chapter 7, he's going to be put on a boat. You know, you can look back on that screen if it helps you're sitting in the back and you can't see. But So he's going to be put on a boat. Let me see if my little thing works. There we go. He's going to be put on a boat, and the whole point is to get from here to over here to Rome, because that's where... So, of course, um, we'll take the, uh, the boat. Um, and so when we look at Acts chapter 7, we're going to kind of work through this, because... There's a lot of stuff, even in this count, in this chapter, of how do we manage crisis? How do we manage situations that arise that maybe we've got ourselves into it? Have we learned how to become good listeners in the midst of crisis? 
Because if you think about it, when you and I go into a crisis, and maybe that's why the Lord brought up Philippians 4, 6, and 7, because when we're in a crisis, um, we get anxious. Uh, when we get anxious, we get fearful. When we get anxious and fearful, we start making decisions trying to get ourselves out of the crisis. And yet, where did the decisions come? Where are the decisions coming from? How does God want to direct us in the midst of that? Everyone, every follower of Jesus Christ is going to go through crisis. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to go through crisis. And this actually has to do with 276 souls on a ship where you have a few that are believers and you have a lot that aren't. And yet, um, there is one voice that God uses to help steer them to safety. But whose voice are you and I going to be listening to when we're in the crisis? That's such a key. I mean, just as Robin just testified, there's this voice. Well, was it Robin's voice? Or was it the Holy Spirit speaking to her because God is saying, it's not your time yet, and this is, you know, how does God want to direct us? And so, it, so let's start with, with Acts chapter 27. And Luke, if you'll go back, yeah, I'm going to be having Luke kind of go back and forth in this. But, yeah, so Luke, Acts 27, 1, it says this, And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adrimitium, I probably missed, yeah, that probably wasn't right, which was about to sail to the ports along the, the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day, we put in at Sidon. Now, when we say we, uh, the book of Acts was written by Luke. So already we've got, we, we know that there's three believers that are on this ship. There is Paul, there is Luke, and there is... Um, Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. Now, Julius, again, he is the one that's in charge of the prisoners that are on the ship. Paul is one of them. He's in charge of basically what goes on in the ship, and yet it says here that for Julius, who is the centurion, he treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends. And it doesn't say anything about Julius being a believer at this point. The very fact that Luke uses his, his name could be an indicator that maybe through this experience he did give his life to Christ. But the very fact that it says Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends, remember that Paul is a prisoner. And it says there's 266, 276 souls on board. There's other prisoners. There's no other mention of other prisoners being treated kindly but Paul. And, and, and I think that part of the passage speaks so much more about Paul's character and how he carried himself as a prisoner. He's appealing to Caesar, but he's going to see Caesar as a prisoner. He is... He's looked at as a criminal, but how does he carry himself? And I'm thinking, you know, I think it's easy for us to know a little bit about Paul at this point of how he carries himself when we look at, I can't get the next one. Could you change the next one for me, Luke, please? Or is it stuck? There, there's two passages, and I even mentioned this in, in, in Sunday school. Galatians 2.20, Paul's outlook of life and how he saw his whole life. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul's life was not his own. And so the way that he carried himself was one of saying, I am loved by Christ and I have this calling to love others. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, implore you 
on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. I think out of Paul's lips, there was love, there was grace, there was truth. Julius got to know this man just for a short while. He carried himself with dignity. He carried himself with grace. He carried himself with love. And so out of the, the way that he carried himself began to change the way that Julius treated him. And I think many times in our life, it really does matter how we carry ourselves. We, we may be looked upon in a business situation as just a worker, a piece of meat, basically. But how you and I carry ourselves can change someone's heart and how they treat us. That's not a given. But do you and I, when, when we... Well, when you walked in here to this, this morning, did you walk in here with the view, I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and I am representing Christ right this very minute? And then when you and I leave this church and you go back home, do you carry yourself in your home, I'm an ambassador of Christ. I am here to reflect Jesus in my home. Or wherever I am. You know, that's the thing about an ambassador. And that's Paul's outlook as a prisoner, as free man, as a slave, as a prisoner. I I'm here to represent Christ. And so if I'm going to be on this boat before Julius and the others, I represent him. And, a and an ambassador is someone who doesn't get, get to give their opinions. Y do you understand? I mean, a an ambassador actually is told how to represent the government. You want me to say this? I, I don't want to say that. Okay, you're fired. <laughs> I mean, right? No, that if you're an ambassador, you represent and you speak what has been given to you from those that are in authority over you. And you are to act in a way that best represents your country. And Paul is not saying, I represent Israel. Paul is not saying, I represent the Jewish race. Paul is not saying, I represent a, a religion. No, he says, I represent Jesus Christ. And so in whatever situation you and I find ourselves in, do you have the mindset that you are an ambassador of the king? In that as an ambassador of the king, with I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. It's, it's, it's that place of saying, I'm going to be restrained. I'm not, I don't have permission by the king necessarily just to give my opinion. I think that really flies in the face of how we Americans a lot of times think is because, hey, I'm just, I'm just going to, hey, I'm being honest with you. Hey, I'm just going to I'm just telling you as it is. Hey, I'm just going to give my opinion on this. That's The child of God doesn't have that right. The child of God saying, "How do you want me to represent you before this person? How do you want me to speak before this in this situation?" See, that, that should shift us in a bigger way because it calls us to a life of prayer. We've, we've got to, an ambassador has to be on the phone. I'm about to meet this person. What, how do you want, what do you want me to say, right? And so for us, when you look at a passage like this in Acts 27 and we think about how Paul carried himself into even this situation with the view of being an ambassador, it's okay, Lord, lead me. And may my words be your words. May my actions be your actions. Because I represent you. See, that right there in and of itself is a struggle for right. I mean, we struggle with that because we like to give our opinions. We like to give what we're thinking. And, hey, I'm just going to speak what's on my mind. And where the ambassador learns how to be restrained. Exercise that self-control, saying, Lord... What do you have to say about this particular situation? How do, I, how do I carry myself? And I think the way that Paul carried himself into this situation changed Julius in the way that Julius saw Paul. Oops, got a change for me again there, Luke. Sorry. 
Acts 27, 9 says this, Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous. So yeah, go back to the map there. We'll look at the, the map. And so here's the voyage, and from here throughout, and it talks about going around the Lee of Cyprus. That word Lee means a, a shelter, shelter from the winds. And then, you know, it, it says they, they landed here in Myra in Lycia, and they went on to Snidus. Now, here is the passage. Actually, um, Luke, you don't have to go to that. I'll just kind of jump there. It says, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, when it says that it became dangerous, the voyage became dangerous because even the fast was already over. In some versions, it says the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was for the Jews recognizing how God delivered them out of Egypt. It recognized God gave the covenant with the Ten Commandments. It was an important day. It's still celebrated today in Judaism. It's called Yom Kippur. And so yet that day is celebrated in October. So we actually understand that during this time, it's winter time in that region when storms and heavy winds can arise. And so it says even the voyages, it was getting difficult and the fast was already over. Well, here's the thing. What do we know about the fast? And why is, is Paul saying it? Because they've been fasting and praying. They've been fasting and praying. The atonement for Paul meant something completely different now, that he knew who came to atone for the sacrifices for our sins. He, he knew who came to atone for our sins, and that's Jesus Christ. And yet there's still that sense that it's being mentioned as a celebration. But now to celebrate Christ, to celebrate the cross of Jesus. But to fast and pray, that's the day of atonement. We're going to fast, we're going to pray, we're going to confess our sins, repent of our sins. That's what that whole uh, time was about for the Jews and for those that were Christ followers. It's like Lent season for Christians today. You know, that leads up to the resurrection. You know, fasting and praying and, and letting God probe our heart. But it was during this time where the weather got difficult. And it says... And it says that Paul spoke up during this time. Paul advised them saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Now here is the interesting thing because Paul is not speaking as someone in authority in terms of he's not a sailor, he's not a fisherman, so, but he's, he's actually stepping into the conversation. He's saying, sir, I, I perceive. That word perceive means I've been looking at, I've been observing with the rest of you. <laughs> but my conclusion is, hey, if we go on any further, we're in trouble. But it says, as the centurion who's in charge, which is Julius, says he paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Who should he be paying? Who should the centurion be paying attention to? Should he be paying attention to the pilot and the owner of the ship, the pilot who has been doing this for years and years and years maybe and who is experienced in studying the winds and the, and the tides and, and actually the ship owner who has built the very ship and knows all about the ship and, or Paul who is a theologian slash criminal slash being sent. Who, who should he take the advice of? I mean, if you are the centurion at this moment, who carries more weight? Who has more experience? Well, it's the pilot and the it's the pilot and the owner of the ship. And yet, who should they be listening to? 
Who is actually, when Paul says, sir, I perceive, is God perhaps speaking in and through Paul to try to get the attention of the people? To avoid a crisis? You know, I think, you know, many times, you know, if, if you and I are ever in a financial crisis, who do we go to for counsel? I mean, we, we go to the one who's been trained. We go to the one who has the experience. And so this actually, this passage flies right in the face of kind of just automatically going to the one with the experience. Have we ever thought, like, if you're a driver, and this is to the guys, so if you're driving, and you've got this voice that speaks to you, hey, honey, you should have taken, you should be taking this exit next. No, no, I got this. It's on further. And then you go a little further, and though in you, you're like, oh, man, I should have heard that voice. I, I should have listened. And you've got that voice, but you, know, you should have. Because now the, up above, there's like all this construction, and now you've kind of got yourself into a mess. And, and what's actually got yourself into a mess is the mentality, I know better. Is the mentality, I don't really need counsel coming from you because you're not driving right now. I mean, and I share that as kind of a confession because that's happened a lot in our household where Candy's my co-pilot and before there were GPS's, there were maps and when we would be driving, she's like, I think you need to do this. I'm like, no, I got it. You know, then, then crisis. <laughs> then crisis. So what happens here is that they listen, the centurion listens to the pilot and the owner of the ship. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there. So, so here is, so they've landed, they've landed here. And, and it was winter time, and Paul is saying, no, we shouldn't go any further. But, but now you've got the pilot, the You've got the owner of the ship, and now you have the majority speaking. And so the majority definitely rules, and the majority knows best. And so you have all of these voices. And so here's the thing. We don't like where we're stationed because this port's not suitable for winter, so we're going to just hop right over here to Phoenix. So it's not like this voyage. It's just from here to here. So I looked at a, yeah, I looked at this map. It's, it, it's about 40 miles. We can make 40 miles. Let's do it. Sir, I perceive if we go any further, we're going to be in trouble. No, we got this. We've got the experience. We know how to do this. Who are you? Okay. And that's many times, if God's trying to get our attention, and here's this beautiful gift that God has given all of us in this room. It's called free will. And that free will, we've got counsel, we've got voices, but ultimately, we get to choose. And so, because the majority and everyone else is speaking, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to go from here to here. You know, free will happened in the Titanic. The ship that could not be sunk. But yet there were many warnings to the captain, hey, there's icebergs in the water in this time. Okay, I know it. Hey, we're going to put the ship full throttle. And, and, and for the lookout, the binoculars, they're, they're found locked up because this is the ship that could not be sunk. What's that called? Pride. Pride comes before the fall. Arrogance. I know better. I got this. We know better. We got this. We're going to sail from here to here. They never arrive here. But because of the winds, 
they got caught up in this tempest and they got driven out to sea. They found themselves in a crisis. And that's what many times, and I have found, I've, I've had this in my own life, and I think you and I can probably testify, there's probably stories in here of when we have made decisions because we know better, we've got the experience, or we're just going to find other voices or the majority, and we're going to go with the majority, and we find ourselves in a storm. Part of what's going on in our nation right now is because this, the majority, and we're in this storm, and the majority is trying to say, this is what morality looks like today. And we're in a storm. And we're losing our kids right and left in the midst of this storm. And we're not, and it's not unbelievers, it's believers because we haven't learned how to listen. We have not learned how to listen to the one who wants to speak and give us direction. That's what I love about God. God is not someone who is sitting somewhere far away, aloft from us, but what Christ did on the cross for us is he opened up the, the veil and says, you have access to me. Come and ask. Come and inquire of me. Talk to me. Ask me for help. And there's one guy in this group that I believe that is asking for help and asking for guidance, and it's, and it's Paul. And so even in the midst of the crisis, there's this one man in the group that is still calling out to God. I love a passage, when we deal with a passage like this in a crisis moment, Luke, if you could go back and scroll through it. I just want y'all to see this, because this is Romans chapters 8, verse 28, right here. Romans 8, 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Again, this is Paul being inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's got experience learning how to listen and to obey in the midst of his weakness. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches our hearts knows what is, in, what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, and this is the most popular, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. When everyone else on the boat was losing hope, Paul held fast. He, because he knew that in the midst of crisis, God is still at work. In the midst of crisis, it's not where God is shaming us or where God is looking out and saying, I told you so, you're going to have to just tough this one out on your own. It's in that moment, there, there's, that, there's the Paul who says, you know, God, they're not listening, but you're going to work this out. I don't know how but would you work this out, God? How many of y'all are in that? How many of you have kind of undergone that maybe over the last week, months, where there's been this crisis, but there is God wanting to wanting to give very... well you know going through this path it gets to where you know it, as the tempest hit in verse 15 and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind we gave way to it and were driven along running under the lee of a small island called Kata. we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat after hoisting it up they they used supports to undergird the ship then fearing that they would run aground on citrus, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. And if you go further in verse 20, it says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was last abandoned. You know, 
many times with addiction, God allows us to get to the very last part before he'll step in. There wasn't going to be in this passage, there wasn't going to be Jesus commanding Paul, saying, speak to the wind and calm the wind. It wasn't going to be one of those moments. It was going to be one of those things where the decisions that were being made put them in this situation, but God was still allowing them to get to a place where even those around would lose hope of being saved. And yet in those moments, God can still and he does, he speaks. He wants to give direction. He wants to give hope. He many times lets us to those places so we'll actually learn how to listen and call on him. He'll, he'll, he'll put us there. He'll, he'll allow us to get there where we have to learn how to recognize who is in charge and who is not. How many of y'all can say yes, amen to that? I mean, in the sense of You've been there, and yet you've seen God then come through when you call on him. And that's just God teaching us, hey, I want to be in charge of your life. Will you allow me to lead you? Verse 21, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood among them and said, men, you should. Okay, this is one of those I told you moments. I told you so. Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet, now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. See, they've actually been praying. They've been praying, but they haven't been praying to the one true God. They haven't been praying to the one who created all things and who can calm the storms and the one who can get them out of the spot. They've been praying. But Paul is declaring, I have been praying to the one who is my God and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God has granted you all those who sell with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But you, but we must run aground on some island. It is so interesting that as Paul has been seeking the Lord, God came and spoke to him to give him very a clear message, not only for him, but those around him. See, God was not just for Paul. God was actually for the other men. He wanted the other men who were lost to know Christ. He wanted the other men to know who God truly is. It's like this aspect of, it brought me back to the message of Jonah. Jonah who's run away from the call of God and he, in his disobedience he puts himself in a crisis and those around him in a crisis and yet when he gets thrown overboard, swallowed by a fish, there's God when he starts calling on him. And I think, you know, in this passage, it's like God still is trying to reach out to these men saying, I am God. Trust me. But for these men to recognize who God is, Paul had to press in himself to hear what God was saying, where an angel was sent. And I, 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 I'm not standing here before you that I've ever recognize an angel speaking to me but I've had many instances where the voice of God has spoken to me and given me very much clear direction in the midst of crisis sometimes the the voice that the God is speaking is just this be not afraid right now Lonnie and I'm not really sure how the outcomes but it's don't be afraid I'm with you again that scripture <laughs> lo I'm with you always even to the end of the age and so but Paul had to speak this prophetic word to this group. And I'm like, in a situation, in a crisis, are we a people pressing in to really hear what God is saying? Are we willing to wait upon God until he speaks? 
or are we just in a hurry? Are we in such a hurry to get ourselves out of this situation where we don't spend time long enough to say, God, what are you doing? Would you speak to me? I messed up. <laughs> Help me. No. That's what fear and anxiety, it gets us to rush when God is saying, press in to hear. Hear what I have to say. Verse 27, when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land, and it goes on. But in verse 31, it says, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men, because they want to get out of the boat, they're getting fearful and anxious. They're wanting to jump ship because they think the ship's going to run aground. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Notice the switch. They are no longer listening and giving orders by the owner of the ship and the pilot. Now they're actually willing to listen to how God is wanting to direct them, use And what they actually do is something that doesn't make sense because they cut away the ropes of the ship's boat, that's the lifeboat, and let it go. The last hope, they're saying, okay, we're going to trust you in this, and, and whew, okay, here we go. Is God really God? You know, cutting that, that last hope is sometimes what God does in our own lives. Like, you and I, when we're in a crisis... What is your security? What are you holding on to that keeps you feeling secure or where you're still kind of in control? Is it your intellect? Sometimes the Lord says you can't rely on your own understanding in the midst of this. Is it your money? Is it your stuff? You know, here is the prophetic word. It wasn't that there wasn't going to be loss. The word was, if you stay in the boat, everyone will be saved, not be saved. The boat actually is going to get destroyed. But you all are going to be saved, just stay the course. There's going to be loss. And that's where sometimes God, I'm, I'm sure like the owners, like, thanks God, that's my living. How many of us hold on so tight to the job or the money that it's like God is saying, were well, you willing to just let go? Lord, I want to stay with this house. Let go. Lord, I want fill in the blank. And the Lord says, are you willing to cut it loose and let me direct you? I want to be in charge. I want to lead you through this crisis, you and your family the ropes let what's the term let go and oh that's hard can you because we have to actually let go there's something many times that we're being called to let go of you let it go or you release it you know for me it's me going on sabbatical this is a very timely message for me because like I said, the first week's going to be fun, I think. The second week, I'm going to have to really learn how to let go. I'm going to struggle. But that's where you find God. When he's speaking directly on the things that we're holding so tight to, and he's saying, cut the rope. That's not your security. Let me be your security in this. Verse 33, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food. Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will, be, it will give you strength. And then in verse 35, it says, when he had said these things, he took bread he, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all who he broke it and began to eat. Do you realize when he says he's giving thanks, actually Paul has gathered them there 
and there is a worship service taking place in the midst of a crisis. There is actual worship and a giving, breaking bread. What, what, what happened at, on the uh, road to Emmaus? When Jesus broke the bread, their eyes were open. They saw him for who he was. It's the breaking of bread, and it's that place of saying, we're going to worship you in the midst of crisis. We're going to worship you. We're not safe yet, but we're going to worship you because you are God. And that's what Paul is trying. Get your eyes on Jesus. In the midst of, get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes off of the boat. Get your eyes off the rocks. Get your eyes off or the feeling of the wind. No, get your eyes on Jesus and worship him. Call for a worship service. Break some bread together. Take communion. Remember what Christ has done and that he has you. That's what's happening in the boat. He's calling them to a life of faith. He's calling them to begin worshiping the one true God. And then, it, and then in verse 39, Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with, on, with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. Verse 31, But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The boat struck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldiers' plan, their, their life was still not safe. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away, because they're good soldiers. They're going to stay disciplined in that. But the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. And the rest on planks were on pieces of the ship, and so it was that all were brought safely to land. It wasn't pretty, but God is faithful. It wasn't pretty, but God remained sovereign and in charge. He's just calling us. See, here's the thing. I think when we talk about God's sovereignty, here's where it's kind of tricky for, I think, so many Christians. We can take sovereignty to a place of unhealthiness. God's in charge, and whatever I do, it doesn't matter. No. God is in charge. He's sovereign. But he's also giving you free will. And we can take free will to the other place, too. Like, I, can, I have free will to do whatever, and God's really, no. Somewhere in there, there is both God's sovereignty at work, and yet there's this gift of free will. And it's the decision you and I have, even after this service, is who is going to be in charge of our life? It's a choice you and I make. And the circumstances that we're going to have outside these church walls, it's like, okay, what choice are you going to make? Because I guarantee, I believe this, after a message like this, each one of us are going to be put in certain circumstances where we're going to be called to make a decision. Are we going to first turn to God and say, what do you want? What are you calling us into? Or, are we going to rely on our experience? Are we going to go to someone, to the experts? Or are we first going to turn to the one who is the king of kings and say, would you give some clarity here? I'm, I'm needing it. Yeah. God is so faithful. He is so good and he is so merciful. Even when we mess up, he's still working. Amen? So let's stand, if we could, and... Um, I do want us to sing, um, and again, it's not on the on the deal. Robin just let us, I love you, Lord. But I would like us to sing that just as a praise to him. And here is the thing as we sing it. I just want to encourage you to open your hands up. This is that place of saying, I, I just want to yield to you right now. I love you, Lord. And it's that place of saying that you be in charge. If there's anything that you need to cut loose of, cut loose of it. 
But um, let's just love him. Let's honor him with this song. Jesus. Love you, Lord. I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King. In all you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound. you to uh, be seated, but I am going to ask real quick uh, Doug and Barbara and Thad and Hannah and Tim uh, to come forward real quick. Yeah, you can actually be seated. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead and be seated. So the last few weeks we have been doing, uh, going through a um, membership class uh, with, with couples and Tim and just had a really good time. Um, and they've written their testimonies and sat with the elders and just had a really good time with them. But uh, these two couples and Tim, they've said, we, we want to become members of the church. And uh, they've been church family, but we want to just kind of press in and, and be, join and become members. And so uh, for us, I want us to welcome them as members of FCC. Um, they're on the screen. Uh, you're going to have to... So... The congregation, I'd like us to read this in unison. And this is just, um, just a, to recognize that we have the same confession. And so, congregation, if we could read this. We confess in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, give ourselves to his service, and take this to be his church. We recognize our need to be in fellowship with one another and our dependence upon the empowering work of the Holy Spirit to prepare ourselves for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. By God's grace, we will walk in this Christian love, putting one another's interests above our own. We will be a community of faith set on stirring one another to love and good deeds. We have as our mission to be a Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family, all for his glory and honor. And the next slide, please. And our congregation, uh, to these two couples in Tim Church, if we could read this out. We welcome you with joy in the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together. And I'm going to ask y'all after the benediction um, just to come and give them that right hand of fellowship. So if we'd stand and just receive the benediction, please. As you leave here today, would you leave here with a heart submitted to Christ the Lord? Would you leave here today with with ears to hear what he is saying. And he who loves you wants to direct your steps. So go 
and the power of the Holy Spirit who wants to counsel you throughout. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Be blessed.